Welcome to another Learn Electronics Repair beginners video and this week we're going to look at capacitors. All you need to know about capacitors to fix stuff. So capacitors, these are a very common electronic component. Uh, together with resistors, they probably form the most two common components that you will find on circuit boards and schematic diagrams. First, let's have a look at the schematic symbols for a capacitor. Now, there are a few different symbols, and some are kind of like old and uh, maybe more obsolete now. But you may find them on old circuit diagrams, and also there were originally kind of European uh, style symbols and American style symbols. But these are the most common ones that are in use, so let me show you. The symbol for a capacitor, a non-polarized capacitor, is this, okay? And sometimes that can also be uh, drawn as this, with a solid block in there. Okay, and those are the common symbols for non-polarized capacitors. A non-polarized capacitor is one which does not have a positive and a negative terminal. It works the same both ways around. Uh, the other main type of capacitor we find are polarised. Now, the polarised have a positive and a negative terminal, and they must be connected in the circuit the correct way round. So these are the common uh, symbols that you will find for uh, polarised capacitors. So we have this one. Uh, sometimes with a plus sign, but basically the block, this is the positive terminal. It may not have the plus symbol against it. Yeah? It may just be the straight uh, symbol so there's this one um, another common one is this and it's the same so the straight bar is a positive sometimes again on the schematic there may be a positive sign against it but not always there's an old type of symbol which you really probably only find on vintage uh, schematic diagrams which is like this one okay and those are the main symbols that you find for polarised electrolytic capacitors. And again, on this case, this is the positive end. Um, this one, although non-polarised, is often used for a particular type of non-polarised capacitor called non-polarised electrolytic capacitor, which are high-value ones. Um, there's a few more symbols that you might come across for capacitors. Uh, there's this one which is a variable capacitor. And this one, which is a preset variable capacitor. So this would be like, for instance, a tuning control on a radio. And this would be like have a little screw that you just set it to the, the value you want and leave it preset at that value. Uh, there's another archaic uh, version of this, which is like that, which I'm aware, I'm aware of the symbol with a little arrow at one end but I've never actually seen it on a schematic diagram. So those are the main symbols for variable capacitors. These you only really find in radio frequency circuits. You don't find them anywhere else, really. Um, these are the more general. The common symbols are that one, uh, really that one, and this one. Okay, so that's how you would see a capacitor on a schematic diagram. Capacitors have two main ratings or values. So you have the actual capacitance itself of the capacitor. The capacitance of the capacitor. Yeah. And this is rated in farads. Now, one farad is a very large amount of capacitance, and it's not what you would find in normal circuits. So usually, the rating is either in microfarads, which is like a little Greek mu sign, microfarads, which effectively is one millionth of a farad. You will find nanofarads, nanofarads, which are effectively one thousandth of that, like one thousandth of a million, uh -huh. and picofarads, which are a thousandth of again. The main way easy to remember this is not to worry about all these zeros. But basically, 1,000 picofarads equals 1 nanofarad. Yeah? And 1,000 nanofarads 
equals one microfarad. Okay. The values of capacitors you're most likely to find are generally between about one nanofarad and about 10,000 microfarads. Smaller ones than one nanofarad normally only in high frequency circuits. And it's very unusual to find large capacitors more than 10,000. I mean, you can, but you won't find them very often. So that's the main range of capacitors that you will find in actual circuits. The other main rating you have for capacitors is voltage. And the voltage of a capacitor will vary from about 2.5 volts to many thousands of volts, yeah, 1,000 volts plus. And maybe even to the tens of thousands. But that's, again, a specialist area that you won't really come across much. Certainly not in the stuff that I repair, for sure. Um, the voltage of a capacitor is the maximum working voltage. It's not the voltage the capacitor needs to work at. It's the maximum voltage that the capacitor can work at before it breaks down. So, if you, for instance, find a 16-volt capacitor, it doesn't mean there will be 16 volts in it. That could be on a 12-volt a supply, it could be on a 5-volt supply, but it couldn't be on a 24-volt supply. It can't be on a higher supply than the voltage rating. So, regarding the voltage, as long as the maximum working voltage is higher than the supply voltage, that, that's fine. The most important characteristic of a capacitor is that a capacitor will block a DC current. So a DC current will not flow through it, but it allows an AC current to flow through it. The main uses of them are for filtering, for smoothing, which effectively is a kind of filtering. And for timing. So in the case of filtering, a capacitor will pass an AC signal, but the effective resistance, if you like, or the impedance at an AC frequency will depend on the value of a capacitor. So a, a small value capacitor will only pass high frequency signals. A larger value capacitor will be able to pass lower frequency signals. And this can be used in circuits where, for instance, you only want, in a tone control, where you only want the high frequency signal to go through to the speakers. The capacitors are used in that way, and that's a form of filtering. The smoothing, basically, is where you have a circuit. I'll just, just give you an idea. So you have a circuit with a voltage rail, 12 volts, okay? And we have a load powered from that. And we're smoothing your capacitors effectively are just connected to ground. Yeah. Now, the idea of this is that, for instance, when the load is drawing power, it draws it through the circuit trace. And the circuit trace, although it's a piece of copper, will have some resistance. So if this draws more power, you can get very small voltage drops at this end of the copper trace. And that's what the capacitor is there for, it's to maintain the voltage. So any fluctuations, any ripple or noise goes down through the capacitors into the ground. And what you have is a clean DC signal. So that is smoothing, okay? Um, <clears throat> filtering, by the way, is where you have a signal coming through, through a capacitor, effectively, that is filtering. This is also called coupling. And this, by the way, is called decoupling. So you may see those terms, a coupling capacitor, a decoupling capacitor. The coupling, I'll give you a good example of this. We have a transistor circuit, okay? Resistor to ground, resistor to power, and we have some sort of signal coming in here. And the signal comes out here into another transistor. So this is effectively like an amplifier circuit. Now, we may well want the signal to go to the second transistor, but not the DC voltage. So by putting the capacitor in here, it effectively blocks the DC and allows the AC. That's an example of coupling. Okay. Timing. In timing, basically, you have a resistor charging the capacitor with a voltage, say 12 volts ground. 
and the voltage here will increase as you as the capacitor charges so when you switch on this would be zero volts there'd be no charge in it and depending on the value of the resistor and the capacitor it will take a certain amount of time to charge up so the voltage here gradually increases and that's a timing circuit you can effectively detect when the voltage reaches a certain point and cause something to happen uh, this is also used in oscillator circuits where by this sets the frequency of the oscillator which is basically set by how much time it takes that to repeatedly charge and discharge i mentioned that capacitors have two ratings capacitance and farads and working voltage and volts but in actual fact they have three and the third one is esr and this stands for equivalent series resistance and what it means is this if we have a circuit again and on here we have a power supply rail and there's effectively some some noise high frequency noise like you would get coming out of a switch mode power supply because effectively you're sending pulses to high frequency through, through a transformer and this could be for instance your 12 volt supply so we'll put capacitors here yeah to ground and that capacitor effectively charges up to the peak of this voltage, basically. So all the ripple, all the noise actually goes down here through the capacitor. And it goes to ground and it disappears. And here we have a nice clean voltage supply. That is decoupling, which I've just mentioned. Now, the capacitor, it blocks DC. So the 12 volts DC can't flow through here. But... It allows the AC signal. As we say, they block DC, they allow AC. But the capacitor is not like zero ohms to the AC. It has some resistance. And the amount of resistance it has to that noise will affect how much of it goes into the ground and how much of it is still left here, okay? This resistance to ground is called the ESR. And it's measured... At a certain frequency so it's effectively the resistance of that capacitor at a certain frequency for example 100 kilohertz 100 kilohertz yeah so if that frequency is 100 kilohertz how easily does it pass the signal to the noise to ground yeah that is the esr and that's the other important rating that you will find on capacitors now let's have a quick look at capacitors wired in series and parallel in circuits if you have two capacitors wired in parallel draw the symbol properly richard one two capacitors wired in parallel like so yeah side by side across each other the value total value if this one was 100 and this one was 100 the total value is 200 okay so that's how it works if you have 10 of them they'll be 10 times 100 is a thousand yeah, that's how it works if you have capacitors in series like this yeah across the supply and this one is 100 and this one is 100 the total will actually be 50 it'll be half yeah if there was three of them in series it would be a third if there was three in parallel here, it would be three times, 300. That's how it works. You, there's a formula, you don't need to know it. If you want to know at any time what the capacitance is, there are websites with uh, capacitors in series and parallel. You can put in the, the values and it will tell you. Now let's just talk about an important matter, which is the danger that capacitors uh, can cause you will probably know or you've heard that with the electrical equipment or electronic equipment there's a warning to say is do not open it up even if it's not connected to the main supply high voltage can be present yeah and the place the high voltage is present is inside the capacitors so there's an example of this circuit i had with a 12 volt supply this capacitor is filtering out the noise and it's smoothing the voltage. Yeah, it's a smoothing capacitor or a decoupler. And this capacitor will charge up to 12 volts. So when you switch the supply off, you will have 12 volts in here. And the 12 volts will effectively disappear through the load, whatever the load is, whether it's a light bulb or something. 
and that circuit will discharge this capacitor. Now let's have a look if this is a high voltage circuit. So let's say this is 400 volts, yeah? And again, the capacitor is rated, it's a, it's a 450 volt capacitor, and it's on here, and it's filtering out the noise. Again, when you switch the equipment off, this will have 400 volts in it. And the 400 volts, again, will discharge through the load and discharge the capacitor. And it may take some seconds, it depends on how, how much load there is, how much current that's drawing, and how large the capacitor is. Now imagine we have a fault in this circuit. So from here to here is a resistor, okay? And that resistor has gone open circuit. So we, the load is no longer attached. What happens now? We switch on and this capacitor charges up to 400 volts. It can't charge any more because that's the maximum power that's coming in. And the power will be coming in through a diode, a rectifier. So this will come from your AC signal, and it's rectified, okay. Power comes in, charges the capacitor up. There's no load. You switch off, and obviously it's not working. So you think, well, let's open this up and have a look. What voltage do you think is in that capacitor? Well, the chances are there's 400 volt. And it's that 400 volt has got nowhere to go. It can't go back through the diode because the diode will only conduct this way. We'll talk about diodes in another beginner's lesson. But this circuit now is in a dangerous condition. And this capacitor can hold this 400 volt for a long time. Um, I've certainly seen cases where 20 or 30 minutes later, this can still have 300 volts each. And if you touch that capacitor, you're going to give yourself a very nasty shock and possibly even a fatal shock will cause injury. So always remember, high voltage capacitors can be dangerous. You need to make sure they're not holding any charge before you work on the equipment. So what should you do if you have a capacitor which is charged with a high voltage? To make it safe before you can work on the circuit, you need to discharge the capacitor. Now, an old trick, and you may have heard this one, is just to short the capacitor with a screwdriver or a pair of long nose pliers. This is a very bad idea. That will cause a sudden discharge of the capacitor. It will cause a big spark, a flash, and probably a bang. Um, apart from being unnerving, the flash is actually vaporised and molten metal coming from your screwdriver of the terminals of the capacitor. Those little shards of metal, which are white hot, can end up in your eye. That's a good reason not to do it. And thirdly, it's a very stressful thing to do for the capacitor. To discharge a capacitor suddenly like that is very bad for the capacitor. And you may get away with it many times, but sooner or later you will damage the capacitor or it will just fail at a later date with no particular reason. And that's because the stress you put into it when you were discharging it. So the way to discharge the capacitor is to use a resistor. For mains voltage capacitors, 250 volt to 400 volt, I use this one, so this is 3.3 kilo ohms. It's a 5 watt resistor, I believe. And you can just put that literally against the terminals of the capacitor. Or to be safe, if there's a lot of high voltage in it, then you can actually hold this with a pair of insulated pliers and just hold it against the capacitor and discharge it that way. And this will take a few seconds, but this will safely discharge the capacitor. You can check with your multimeter again to make sure it is discharged. And after 10 seconds, that will do the job without a flash, without a bang, with no risk of injury of bits of flight and molten metal into your eye. And it's much better for the capacitor. So that's how you actually discharge the capacitors. Now let's have a look how we test capacitors. So ideally, you need three pieces of equipment. This is a, a multimeter. And my multimeter actually has a capacitance range. And I can put this onto a capacitance range, and I can actually now measure the value of a capacitor. So this is, a, for example, is a um, 10 micro, 100 microfarad capacitor. Okay. So it's a polarized one. It has a negative. So to get the correct reading, you put your black meter lead to the negative. So you can put that on there. I'm set to capacitance, and we can touch the other terminal and we should be able to read the capacitance and it's oh, sorry i i'm on resistance range let me 
Right, now I'm on capacitance, nanofarads. So you should now be able to measure the capacitance. But you'll see, it takes a long time to do it. Yeah, 110 microfarads. So it takes a long time to do that with a multimeter. And I think that's pretty much true of all multimeters. Also, this meter, I'm not sure what the largest capacitor it can measure is, but it's not a very, very high value. The better option for measuring capacitors is to use a capacitor meter. This is actual capacitor meter. So with this one, I can set it to 200 microfarads. I can connect it directly across my capacitor, observing the polarity again, okay? And that measures straight away. That's instant, yeah. Considering these are like about £12, £15, or certainly less than £20, they're not very expensive. I'd say it's well worth getting one of these if you're doing any amount of uh, repair work. It, it just saves you time. And this will measure up to 20,000 microfarads. And as low as, uh, well, on the, on the lowest range, it's 200. But that's giving point something. So this will actually read down to effectively point 0.1 of a microfarad. Certainly one microfarad, which is the smallest you're ever likely to come across. So that's a capacitance meter. The third one is an ESR meter. This is an ESR meter. This is a very useful piece of equipment and the only way to read ESR. And some capacitors fail in the way that the circuit will stop working just because the ESR is too high. So in this one, we can just switch it on. I have to hold the button for a few seconds. Uh, again, we can take our 100 microfarad capacitor. Observe the polarity again. Black and red. And that's giving the ESR about 0.4. The, the, I'm holding these because it's slightly worse on this. Point, yeah, about 0.4. So that's reading the... ESR of this capacitor is actually telling you uh, when I measure it that this is good if the capacitor is less than 200 microfarads and it is less than 200 microfarads. Okay. You cannot measure ESR of a capacitor using a multimeter on ohms range. You can only do it with an ESR meter and the reason is that this ESR meter uses a 100 kilohertz AC signal to pass through the capacitor and it measures the capacitor's conductance at that frequency. Whereas this uses the DC uh, current, a DC voltage, to test the resistor. And in the case of a capacitor, it can't test it because it'll just be open circuit, it doesn't pass DC. So I can show you on a normal meter, if I go to the ohms range, and we just uh, take a capacitor, one of these small capacitors. Uh, we can just go here. Okay. Little capacitor. I guess it's a little bit fiddly. I have it, little capacitor, and I can go on the other lead. And it just reads open circuit. Yeah, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. If you take a larger capacitor, you will actually see the capacitor charge up. So if we take this as a 100 microfarads, and you can see it reads the resistance and it goes away. In fact, it's now reading the leakage current, sorry, the, the leakage resistance of that capacitor. Electrolytics tend to be a little bit leaky, but it's just only 4 mega ohms, 4.3 mega ohms, so it's not a lot. I'll just give one more. This is a 3,300. So we can again just go across the capacitor. Now, you saw the capacitor charge up now because it's much larger, yeah? My meter actually is auto-ranging. But eventually, it will charge up and you'll end up with just the resistance of the, of the leakage, basically, if there is any. So, you see, it's just charging and charging slower and slower. This is why sometimes you see, when you measure resistance on a circuit board, that you get a reading that's increasing. Yeah, and that's because it's capacitors in the circuit. And what you're actually seeing is the capacitors charging. But other than that, and apart from if you have a, a capacitance range, your multimeter is pretty useless for testing working capacitors. The only real use it is of is for finding short circuit capacitors and finding leaky capacitors where the leakage is not mega ohms, it's in the hundreds of ohms range. 
so really that's the only use for that it will not tell you a capacitor is good it will help you if you pretty sure the capacitor is faulty it will prove it's faulty this meter is about 20 pounds a bit less maybe and i think it was a very nice thing to buy and it was quite cheap if you get one for less than that it's more convenient than using the multimeter for measuring capacitors this thing to me is pretty much essential since i bought this it was about 45 pounds and i've never ever regretted buying this esr meter this has found faults for me numerous times that i could not find another way apart from maybe just changing all the capacitors this thing has paid for its 45 pound over and over again so if you are serious about this or you're just a serious hobbyist in this buy yourself one of these and i'll guarantee you within a fairly short time that will pay for itself and after that it will just be a little money earner for you so how do capacitors fail and are they reliable are they not reliable well, actually, contrary to popular belief, capacitors are actually very reliable components. Um, with capacitors, if they do fail, they normally fail on their own accord. They don't fail usually because something else has caused it. There's probably at least a couple of exceptions to this. One is if the circuit has failed in such a way that the capacitor is now subjected to a higher than its working voltage. Like a voltage regulator fails and the rail that should have 12 volts on now has 30 volts on and the capacitors are rated at 16 that will cause the capacitors to fail the other one is and i can sort of show you this on a diagram probably the other one is a situation whereby you have a circuit so you have a power supply power supply and this is effectively rectified dc so it's just ah oh, this is not volts this is a pulse DC signal, okay. And coming out of here, goes to some sort of load, okay. So this is your load, okay. And we have here a smoothing capacitor, or smoothing capacitors, okay. So the idea of this is this capacitor charges up to the peak voltage of this. So this is... 24 volts this will charge up to 24 volts and the load will have a nice smooth supply and this is designed in such a way that the current that this draws is not sufficient to discharge the capacitor before the next pulse of power comes along so this is effectively repeatedly getting charging pulses and it's designed so that this charge and stays pretty much charged and this doesn't draw so much current that this will discharge and you get a nice smooth supply 24 volts what can happen is this load can fail this can go effectively to a not a short but to a low resistance something can go wrong in here and it's now effectively a very low resistance there's a short inside the circuit somewhere instead of now say it was designed to draw one amp it now is drawing 10 amps what happens now is this capacitor will try to supply the voltage during the trough here when there's nothing coming in this will try to supply the voltage out so on the first peak this will charge up and the current flows this way as this voltage drops because the current this is drawing this has to supply current back out to try and maintain the voltage so this is repeatedly charge discharge charge discharge and depending on the frequency of the mains if it's 60 hertz mains this will probably be 100 this will be 120 hertz so 120 times a second this is trying to charge and discharge very rapidly and that causes what's called ripple current so there's a current flowing backwards and forwards through here as it's trying to maintain the voltage and that current effectively can cause the capacitor to fail this is normally an electrolytic capacitor and contains liquid and what happens is basically the liquid boils because the heat generated by this yeah and these will normally explode so that's the two instances where you can find really capacitor failed because something else was wrong with the circuit too much voltage or too much ripple current the way capacitors fail mainly is they go short circuit okay they go short circuit so between the two 
plates effectively is an insulator in between the dielectric and this can effectively get a short circuit through it, a break. Yeah, that's one of the commons. This capacitor now goes short circuit. Quite often in this case it will burn up, smoke or explode. Okay. The other common way to go faulty is leaky. A leaky capacitor is the same if you like as a short but effectively there's a resistance between the two and this could be like 500 ohms or something like that yeah or 100 ohms couple hundred ohms not enough to cause a short but it passes a dc current when it shouldn't pass any dc and that also can happen and the third one is that they go um low capacitance and high esr that's the third way. The short circuit capacitors, this normally happens in surface mount capacitors, which are called MLCC, multi-layer ceramic capacitors. And I'll show you one so you can actually see what these look like. I'll just get a, a circuit board here. So let me find some MLCCs on here. Yeah, okay. So these capacitors here, these are MLCC capacitors, see another one there, yeah. And to be quite honest, lots of smaller ones, there's one here. Uh, I mean, they'll be all over this board, there'll be plenty of them, yeah. There's a whole block of them here. These type of capacitors, when they fail, they tend to go short circuit. And the reason that happens is because they have a crack in them. And they're made of ceramic, which is pottery, so they're very brittle. The reason they'll get a crack on them is normally because the board is heating up and cooling down when it's used and when it's not used. And the change in temperature causes expansion and uh, expansion and contraction. And eventually that will fracture the, the capacitor. Or the item's being dropped, that's another reason, that's some sort of mechanical shock. Yeah. Now, you might wonder why a capacitor, if it's got a crack in it, it's not open circuit because it's got a crack in it, yeah? So it'd be open circuit, but that isn't the case. An MLC capacitor, MLCC, is kind of made like a wafer biscuit. So I'll just draw what, what you have inside it. You have something like this, like a comb, yeah? And then you have like another comb. This is like your wafer biscuit, yeah? And that's how the capacitor's formed. And what happens when you get a crack through here? Imagine you take a wafer biscuit, yeah, with multiple layers. You've seen these biscuits, yeah, with or without chocolate on them, or with or without chocolate cream in them. If it breaks through there, it shears, yeah. One side or the other side, if you move it up or down, what will happen is that this piece of wafer will touch that piece of wafer, yeah. And that's how the short occurs. Literally because one piece of wafer touches the other piece of wafer. And because it's so microscopic, it takes a very small amount of movement. That's why they go short and they normally burn up then. Or they'll cause something else to blow because there's a short circuit in the, a short circuit now on that voltage rail. Okay, so that's how they fail. Leaky capacitors normally affects this type. These are also ceramic capacitors. And with these Effectively, the dielectric, that's the insulator between the two metal plates, breaks down and it starts to be the few hundred ohms, and that causes a current to flow through. A, a good example of this would be the sort of failure. This is a real failure you'll find. You've got a microprocessor, okay? Microprocessor. And it has a reset pin. Reset, yeah? And it's active low. If I put a line over it, that means low is reset. And this is connected to a resistor. And this goes to 12 volts. And here is a capacitor. And this goes to ground. Okay. And I've seen this happen. So when you first apply the power, the capacitor is discharged. So there's no voltage here. It's zero. And that is reset. It's held low. And of course, over a fraction of a second, over a second, this charges up. And when this reaches a certain voltage, the reset comes off and the processor starts to run. Okay. Now, to give a, a reasonable amount of time, this here could be like, for instance, like 47, 
killer rooms, quite a big resistor. If this goes leaky, so effectively in internally it forms a resistance, and that is like a hundred ohms, yeah, hundred ohm. This is now a voltage divider, yeah, and most of the voltages across that one, fifty thousand compared to the one hundred, yeah. So what happens is the voltage here can't charge up; it can only stay very low. Um, I can get a calculation calculator and work it out was a fraction of a volt so that never loses the reset and it never comes off and I've only ever seen it occur with these I'm sure if you guys have seen others you'll let me know the third type of capacitor that's likely to fail are these these are electrolytic capacitors and these contain inside them a chemical stew basically with metal foil wrapped around it and the chemical effectively forms the dielectric, the insulator inside here. Firstly, these age. So these have a shelf life. They won't last forever. Yeah, they do have an age. Uh, and again, because of heat, they can dry out. The liquid inside them can eventually evaporate and they will dry out and they will lose the capacitance. When these fail, normally they lose the capacitance. So they started off at a thousand microfarad capacitors. They may now only be a hundred uh, microfarads. And secondly, the ESR, the equivalent serial resistance, can go from being, as I measured one of these, 0.3 of an ohm, and it can now be like 10 ohms. So it doesn't pass the AC signal through properly. And that's the most common way that those type of capacitors fail. I also mentioned, by the way, these capacitors will fail in storage. This applies particularly to vintage electronic equipment. It's a bit specialised. But if you've got very, very old capacitors, don't just power the thing up yet. You have to recondition them, and you do it by gradually increasing the voltage across it. This is a good example. If you've got an old car battery, and it's not been used for five years, if you stick it on a charger, it's not going to like it. Yeah, It might even boil. It might even go bang. But if you trickle charge it over a long period and gradually recondition it, so you effectively, if you like putting the, the chemical plating back onto the lead, you can bring it back, and the same with capacitors. So it only applies to vintage, but just remember about reconditioning capacitors, and if you ever work on that sort of equipment, go and Google that and find out how to do it before you just plug it in. Another uh, thing with capacitors, especially the MLCCs, which tend to go short circuit when they fail, it's quite common for a capacitor failing to cause damage to other components on the circuit board. Uh, so if you do find short circuit capacitors, you need to look to see where they are on the circuit and they may well have caused other things. Whatever device is supplying that voltage supply may have burnt out because of the short circuit. So that's something else you need to bear in mind. There's another type of capacity that fails often enough, I think, in my experience, to make it worth mentioning. And that's these type of capacitors. Um, they typically between about 220 nanofarads and about one microfarad, and usually rated around 400 volts, 250 to 400 volts. And these type of capacitors are often used in high voltage circuits and tend to fail by going low capacitance. You'll commonly find them in ATX power supplies and similar. So here's an ATX power supply and there's one here. So this capacitor here is effectively this type of capacitor. And these fail, as I say, by going low in value. Usually that will stop the power supply from working. So that's one always worth checking. And you can measure it with a capacitance meter. ESR doesn't apply to this type of capacitors. That's really for electrolytic capacitors. Another good example of this type of capacitor failing, I've seen this a few times in disco lighting, uh, but it's worth a mention. So basically, the circuit I had basically had AC mains supply. Okay, and it was either 220 volts or it was 100, 140 or 220. 120 volts or 240 volts, okay. And the circuit had basically a capacitor, like this one, connected to a relay, here and the relay adds contacts 
And the idea of this was that the capacitor will block DC, but pass AC is a capacitor. So at 120 volts, there wasn't enough voltage coming through here to turn the relay on. At 240 volts, there was enough current, sorry, well, enough current voltage coming through here to turn the relay on. And that's how it detected the mains voltage. And these contacts switch the voltage to the, the motors inside, the little, little AC motors. So that effectively, when you had a 240 volt supply, you got a reduced voltage going to the motors. And this capacitor failed by going low capacitance, so it can no longer turn the relay on. Because it couldn't turn the relay on, it couldn't switch the voltage to the motors, so the motors burnt out. And I've seen that a couple of times. Uh, manufacturer called Chauvet, by the way, quite a lot of their disco lighting had that. This type of capacitor are also found in valve equipment uh, where they are subject to high voltage and often high frequency signals as well and valve amplifiers and similar equipment. Um, and they fail there in the same way. So if you are working on that type of equipment then you will likely find these type of capacitors that are either going leaky or they are going low capacitance and causing the valve equipment to fail. Now, I just want to talk to you about something which is known as the capacitor plague. You may have heard, particularly with computer motherboards and other devices, that they fail due to faulty capacitors and you need to recap, refit capacitors, new capacitors on the motherboard and that will solve the problems for you. The capacitor plague is something that happened between around 1999 and 2007. And it affected millions of devices. And the reason was due to faulty manufacturer process in the capacitors. So this affected electrolytic capacitors. And I want to show you now a motherboard that was a victim of the capacitor plague. So here you can see you have lots of electrolytic capacitors on this one. And you have lots of sm some small ones here, some bigger ones, yeah and more around here and you'll see that these ones have failed they don't look good yeah this little cross in the top of a capacitor yeah is what is effectively what's called a vent so inside here is a liquid electrolyte and it gets warm during operation and if there's a fault in the circuit as i mentioned too much ripple and too much voltage it can boil or explode and the idea of this vent is that this splits and allows the pressure to release. In doing so, it destroys the capacitor, but it's to stop the actual metal. This is made of aluminium. Can it stop this from exploding like a little grenade, yeah? And you can see what's happened with these ones. In the case of this, the top is actually bulged outwards, whereas you can see that these are fairly flat and those are flat. So these are visibly a good capacitor and this is visibly a bad capacitor. These ones also, the electrolyte, this reddish brown looking stuff, this is the residue from the electrolyte in here, which is leaked out and dried out. And sometimes that comes out from the other end. The bottom of this capacitor will have a, a rubber bung in it. I can probably sh I'll show you one. Like this. The bottom is like a rubber bung. And sometimes, depending on the amount of pressure, this might not release, but it might actually force that bung outwards from the bottom of it. And then this electrolyte, this gunk, can then leak out onto the circuit board. And that can actually cause a lot of corrosion problems. It's very bad for the circuit board. So these are effectively capacitor plague capacitors. And as well as being visibly bad, if I take these from the board, which I'm going to do now, I'm going to measure some of them, you'll see that typically they failed in another way. There's two ways in which they fail. One is that the capacitance will go lower than normal. And secondly, that the ESR will go high. Okay. They can fail in another way, in which case the capacitance goes very high, around double of what it should be, or, or more. But the resistance across the plus and minus is leaky. You can measure a resistance as a high leakage current. So let's take these off this board now, and then let's have a look to see what these look like on our test meter. This capacitor plague 
only really applied to a certain type of capacitor. First of all, they're all low ESR capacitors. And the ones that are fitted in high frequency power supply, switch mode power supply, and book regulator DC to DC converter circuits. And those are the ones which fail. So you can see I've taken off this board, the 40 ones, and you can see this is a 6.3 volts, 3,300 microfarad. And it's also be marked 105 degrees. By the way, when you change capacitors, make sure you put the right temperature ones in. Don't put an 85 where it should be a 105. Uh, another one, same value. And quite often these will be marked low ESR. These are not, but often they are, depending on the brand. Uh, this is Nichicon. Yeah. So again, same value. Same value. So these are actually on the V core voltage supply for this motherboard, the low voltage side for the processor. You can see they're all gone, yeah. So if you look on the top of these, they're all, they're all gone, yeah. This is a, a good capacitor. This is 12,000 microfarad, 16 volts. And this is on the 12 volt supply on the motherboard. And these capacitors are not subject to the same high frequency ripple as these ones. So these don't fail, generally. In the same way this business of recapping motherboards by the way this goes back as i say to about 99 to about 2007. more modern boards and power supplies will have these type of capacitors these are solid electrolytic or polymer capacitors these do not fail in the same way don't think recapping this type of motherboard or device is going to help you okay the place where you find these faulty capacitors is, as I mentioned, computer motherboards and uh, graphics cards, for that matter, I've seen them on, and uh, power supplies, switch mode power supplies. This is where you're most likely to find these sort of issues. And also, on those devices, just because the capacitor looks all right doesn't mean it is. Yeah. You can probably repair a lot of power supplies just by taking all the capacitors out and checking them. So let's test these capacitors now and let's look at this good one as well. And let's see how they look on our capacitance meter and on our EOS R meter. So capacitance meter first. These are rated, as I say, 3,300 microfarads. No, that's, that's the, the 2,000, 3,300. So we need to test them on the 20,000 range because they're more than 2,000. Uh, you should always test them the right way round. So negative, they're marked negative, yeah, positive. The stripe isn't always negative. Watch out for that, guys. It can be positive on some older capacitors. And that's reading about correct. Yeah, three thousand three point three thousand three hundred. As bad as it looks, that actually reads three thousand three hundred. We can visibly see it's bad, but it's reading okay. Here's another one, yeah, this is this one. How's this one reading? Yeah, just case across here. That reads about okay again. This is a little unusual. Quite often capacitors with this type of damage. This one's just bulged. This is slightly better than the other ones. That one's, ah, that one's reading low. Look at that, 2,700. So we know that's a bad capacitor, the bulged one. This is another one of these. This is reading 3,400, and it's reading a bit higher than normal. Now, if it wasn't for the damage on those, you might say they were good capacitors. Let's have a look. This is the, two, this is the 1,200, so we'll go down the range, 1,200. And let's look at it. Yeah, close to 1,200, isn't it? This is a, a good capacitor with 3,300, 6.3, a new one. You can just check this as well, see how this reads. Again, up onto the range. Yeah, it reads 3,300, so that reads correct. So according to our capacitance meter, all these capacitors are okay apart from the one that's bulged, not the one that's leaked, which reads low. Yeah. Now let's see what the EOS, ESR meter tells us about them. So, ESR meter. Switch it on. I have to zero this one first, so we'll just connect the two leads together. 
And we'll see if it's zero. It's close to zero. Just hold the button. That's near enough to zero. Okay. So let's have a look at our capacity again. This is the one that was just a bit bulged. What's the ESR reading? 0.519. Okay, about half an ohm, 0.519. Let's compare that with a good one. So, this is a good one of the same value. 0 0.015. Now you can see the difference. Now you can see the difference. This tells us that this where I find the bulge one is a bad capacitor. That's why you need an ESR meter. Okay? Because if it wasn't visibly bad, you may well think that's a good one. This is one of the leaked ones. What's this read? The capacitance read okay on this. What about the ESR? 0.5. Again, it's about as bad as the other bad one, yeah? Let's look at another one. Another bulge one. The worst ESR I've ever seen was actually over range, more than 100. If you watch through some of my videos, you'll see that one. I've seen some read 50 or 60 ohms or more than 10. Again, that's a bad one. We know what they should read. 0.002 or whatever it was. Yeah. Another one. Yeah, bad. And this is the 16 volt one. Let's see what this reads. This looks like a good capacitor. And I'm expecting it probably is because it's not on the high frequency side. Yeah, 0.014, yeah? Okay. So, there guys, that's why you need an ESR meter. Uh, £40 well spent. Yeah, if you're going to do this sort of work, buy one. Don't rely on these little component analyzers. They're £5. They not very good at doing this they take a long time and they're not very accurate they're not measuring like this okay so that's esr the way that the mlcc capacitors fail normally is that they go short circuit now the problem you'll find with this is these type of capacitors are often mounted many many of them on a voltage rail so this is actually a gpu and you'll probably find that almost all these capacitors are on the same voltage supply uh, I can find the motherboard for you, similar sort of thing. Yeah, so there's like six of them all down here. The chances are these are all on the same voltage supply. The problem when these fail is that with your resistance meter, you can see there's a short circuit on that voltage supply. But it can be difficult to determine what is causing the short. And if there's a lot of capacitors, and the capacitor is the most likely culprit, one of this type, then it can be difficult to find which one. Uh, that brings into a whole different topic of short circuit finding, and I'll be making another beginner's guide, all you need to know about short circuit tracing later. The positive side, or the positive, the plus side of all that, is that where you have many, many, many capacitors on the same voltage rail, it brings us to a topic of redundancy. So when these capacitors fail, these MLCCs, and there's many on a voltage rail, you can usually just remove the short circuit ones. You don't need to worry about fitting replacement ones because generally speaking, the device will work without the replacement fitted. I mean, having said that, if you've got a replacement, there's no reason not to fit the replacement. But if you don't know what the value is or for some reason you have to effectively not replace it in a lot of cases the circuit will still work without those that's these decoupling capacitors obviously if you have an oscillator circuit and that is your timing capacitor there's only one of them or even if there's more than one of them the capacitor value matters it needs to be correct so in that case you have to replace it but say, so just remember that if you've got a short circuit like that, there's another whole row of them down here, and they'll all be on the same voltage supply. And if one's burnt up and it's short, you can remove it, remove the short, and you don't need to worry. Um, if it causes you a problem at all, for instance, on the GPU, it might become unstable under high load, but that's about the worst thing that would really happen in that sort of situation. So we've learned now about how to test capacitors and we had a look at some faulty capacitors so you have an idea of what you're likely to come across in your circuits and repairs. Um, when it comes to replacement of the capacitors, the main important things are that 
it needs to be the correct capacitance or higher. It depends on the circuit. Sometimes you can get away with, you know, it's not very critical. Uh, time of circuits needs to be accurate. But these decoupling capacitors, it really isn't so important. So try to replace with the same value. You could replace it with something higher in some cases. Um, but you must replace it with one of a suitable voltage. So its working voltage must be at least as good as the original or more. These MLCCs, if you replace it with one of the same physical size and value, you can be pretty sure the voltage rating will be fine. On these electrolytics, the voltage rating is marked on them. Yeah, so at least as good or better. Um, this one, by the way, look low ESR I mentioned. Electrolytics, the same temperature rating or better. Okay, if it's a low ESR capacitor, replace it with a low ESR capacitor. It's another matter. Um, the other thing, really, I would say, is with electrolytics in particular. Some circuits can be quite particular about the replacement of these, and I wouldn't just stick any old capacitor in there. The best place to find out if you have a faulty capacitor of what should I fit as a replacement is to go to Bad Caps Forum, badcaps.net. I'll put the link to this on the description to this video and in the comments. The guys on there are a very friendly bunch. They're all hobbies and analysts. Sorry, Hobbies and amateurs, at least most of them are. You'll find me on there. And other amateur hobbies, yeah. And um, some of them are very specialist on capacitors. So it's worthwhile asking. If you've got something that, you know, do I need to fit a replacement? Can I get away without? What should I fit? Go to badcaps.net. Post your question on there. It's completely free. And I'll guarantee that within a few hours, somebody will have replied that and explain to you what you need to do. I mean, replacement capacitors are cheap, so why make things more difficult for yourself? Fixing this stuff is enough of a problem as it is without just causing more complications. One other thing I didn't mention, I kind of mentioned in passing, very important. When you replace electrolytic capacitors, make sure you put the replacement capacitor in the right way round, okay? The negative to ground in almost all cases. If you put this in the wrong way round, the chances are when you switch on, it'll explode. It'll, and it'll make a mess, and it won't smell very nice. So put them the right way round. On most circuit boards, you can tell because you can probably see underneath these ones. In fact, there's one removed here. There's a white area, the black area. And this denotes the polarity. And on this motherboard, if I take my multimeter, what good we can see. Normally the white is negative. Or sometimes it's marked like that. Yeah, it's a negative. Let's have a look at the case of this board if it actually is. I'm on resistance. Uh, let's go to where's that capacitor? Find it's there, yeah. So is this the negative end? Does it go down to ground? Yes, it does. Is this the negative end? Does it go to ground? Yes, it does. But don't trust that. Trust this. Yeah, trust this. Either have a look at the one before you remove it or check. Because on another motherboard, that might be the positive. Yeah, kind of 50-50. That could, that could well be the positive. And if you think it's the negative, you put it in, then you wonder why the capacitor went bang. Okay, so electrolytics, they polarised. Put them in the replacements the right way around. I think that's all you need to know about capacitors to fix stuff. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, put your uh, suggestions in the comments below. And I'll see you all soon on another one. Adios amigos.